Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Keith Combs, Manager of Financial Empowerment with National Disability Institute, and I will be moderating today's webinar. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're very excited about the topic that we're going to be discussing and um, on the benefits of establishing and living within a monthly spending plan. Um, this is a series for or our REI network, and today's webinar is sponsored by Accorda Therapeutics, Bank of America, and Walmart. Nakia Matthews, NDI's Technology and Media Manager, will provide us with some basic housekeeping tips. Thank you, Nakia. Good afternoon, everyone. Actually, this is Elizabeth Jennings providing support for Nakia Matthews today. So I'm going to be um, I'm going to be sharing with you some housekeeping tips. Please bear with me one moment while I operate this. So um, listening to the webinar, the audio for today's webinar is being broadcast through your computer. Please make sure your speakers are turned on or your headphones are plugged in. You can control the audio broadcast via the audio broadcast panel. If you accidentally close the panel, you can reopen it from the top menu item, communicate, and then click Join Audio Broadcast. If you are already listening to the webinar, then you're all set. If you do not have sound capabilities on your computer or you decide that you prefer to listen by phone, please dial in. The number is um, posted for you there. It's 1-855-244-8686. Eight one. That's the toll-free number. The meeting code is six six one three nine five zero eight two. You do not need an, to enter an attendee ID. Real-time captioning is provided during this webinar for those who are deaf, hard of hearing, or for whom English is a second language, or for anyone who would just prefer to read along. The captions can be found in the Media Viewer panel, which appears in the lower right corner of the webinar platform. If you want to make the Media Viewer panel larger, you can maximize other panels like chat, I'm sorry, you can minimize other panels like chat, Q&A, and or participants. We hope that you will submit questions to us during today's webinar. Please use the chat box or the Q&A box to send any questions you have during the webinar to Keith Combs or to Nakia Matthews, and we will direct the questions accordingly during the Q&A portion, which will take place at the end of the webinar. If you are listening by phone and you're not logged into the webinar platform, you can also ask questions by emailing your questions to Keith Combs at kcombs, that's K-C-O-M-B-S, at ndi-inc.org. This webinar is being recorded, and the materials will be placed on the National Disability Institute website at www.realeconomicimpact.org. If you experience any technical difficulties during the webinar, please use the chat box to send a message to myself. It'll show up as Nakia Matthews, or you can also email in, uh, and I apologize, Let's change that email address for today to e Jennings, e j e n n i n g s at n d i hyphen i n c dot o r g, and I will post my email address in the chat box so that if you do have any technical difficulties during today's presentation, you can email me Elizabeth Jennings, today's host, and I'll be happy to assist you. Thank you, Elizabeth, very much. Um, again, we would like to thank our sponsors today, including Walmart, Bank of America, Accorda Therapeutics, the Burton Blatt Institute, and IRS, who without their sponsorship and support, we would not be able to provide the webinar such as we do today. And we would also like to extend a special thank you to Accorda Therapeutics today as well. If you're not familiar with National Disability Institute, we are a national research and development organization with the mission to promote income preservation and asset development for persons with disabilities and to build a better economic future for Americans with disabilities. NDI's Real Economic Impact Network is an alliance of organizations and individuals dedicated to advancing the economic empowerment of people with disabilities 
The network consists of more than 900 partners in more than 100 cities in the United States. The network includes nonprofits, community tax coalitions, asset development organizations, financial education initiatives, corporations, and private sector businesses, federal, state, and local governments and agencies, and individuals and families with disabilities. All of the partners join forces to embrace, promote, and pursue access to and inclusion of people with disabilities in the economic mainstream. On today's agenda, we are going to start with welcomes and introductions. We're going to move into the benefits of establishing and living within a monthly spending plan, have a discussion of why spending plans are important. We're going to introduce you to a zero balance budget and how to use that zero balance budget plan tips to reduce expenses, and we will have time at the end for questions. Some of the outcomes that we hope that everyone in attendance today will have a better understanding of at the end of the webinar is the definition of a zero balance spending plan, the importance of living within a monthly spending plan, how to identify and change spending habits, the importance of setting and working toward goals, and how to make sound financial decisions. The presenter for today is Marlene Ware, and she is the Director of Financial Stability with the National Foundation for Debt Management. Marlene has been a certified credit counselor with NFDM for eight years, and she currently serves as the Director of Financial Stability. Her areas of expertise are financial coaching, development of financial curricula, and delivery of financial literacy presentations. She teaches financial education courses for the Pinellas Habitat for Humanity and is also a certified identity theft counselor. Marlene also travels to Yellow Ribbon events and speaks to returning guard and reserve members about financial issues that directly impact their military careers. We are so very excited to have Marlene speaking on this topic today. And with that, Marlene, I'm going to turn that over to you. Yay, I'm pretty excited to be here too because a um, little transparency here, I love budgets. Um, so thank goodness this is the career area I'm in. Um, and, and I do go um, all over and I do sp speak to many um, people, but I will tell you that the majority of the folks I work with are uh, low to moderate income um, folks. I, I haven't had the pleasure or the opportunity to do budgeting with anyone that is um, higher income. So most of what I'm going to talk about today will have everything to do with low to moderate income people and uh, and it will maybe hopefully impact the way you work with uh, the folks that you work with. But before we begin, let me ask you what compelled you. Why are you even here today? Why would anybody want to hear anybody talk about budgets unless for transparency reasons you love budgets? Um, but are you working with people who have given up on their, their current method of money management? Are they hounded by collection companies? Are they not able to get credit? Is there some reason? Are their feet in the fire for some reason other than just an intrinsic reason to budget? Um, have they have they made you think that they might want to be looking for a different way to control their cash flow? Do they come to you and do they lament about not having enough money? Enough money? Um, do they lament that the creditors are after them? Do you get the feeling that they're not really ready for personal financial accountability or that they really are ready? Are they talking about goals that they want to accomplish? Uh, do they sound like they have a good reason to begin some level of money management. If, you, if you're talking to anyone about budgeting and they haven't bought in, they're not going to stick around uh, for the final result. And that happens to me all the time. Um, do you think they're prepared to make money management an ongoing effort, like a commitment to themselves and their families? Folks get worn out. They really do. They get worn out with managing their money. And it's best if you can tell them right up front that this is a forever deal. It's kind of like eating a healthy diet. If you start eating a healthy diet and you get all trim and slim and feeling good and stop taking your medications, 
that doesn't mean now you get to go start eating ice cream and, you know, Taco Bell. Same thing with, with managing your money or, or using a budget. Once you're in, you're in. You're in for the long haul. So here we are. Here we are, ready to to maybe get your clients interested in, in doing a budget and, and why do they want to? Why would you even get them involved? Maybe because they realize that they do have control over their spending. Their budgets bob and weave and, and they have ups and downs and, and they're updated with every change in their life. It's not static. A budget is not static. They control it. Nobody's going to tell them what to do. They have the reins. It's it's their budget. It's their life. It's their money. Um, they will discover their personal spending uh, sabotage. And I see this all the time. People disappear. I start working with somebody. I'm excited. They're excited. We start the budget, and then they go away. And I don't see them for sometimes a year. And then they come back again. But the the whole thing with, with budgeting is at first there's a little bit of pain. It's like hiding the potato chips under the bed only to bring them out later when nobody's looking or eating the candy bar in the closet when nobody can see you. It's the same thing with, with spending sabotage. Like going to the grocery store and getting your groceries with your debit card and then going ahead and taking that extra 40 home with you when the question pops up, do you want to take money home with you? Putting it in your pocket and, you know, not letting it actually be what it is. You're taking money. You're not spending money on groceries. Or or maybe it's it's a simple thing like um, wandering around in the, you know, the Walmart until you actually find something to spend your money on. Uh, there's a lot of sabotage. I see sabotage a lot. Uh, a spending plan or a budget or, or whatever you want to call it isn't going to work until you're ready, um, it, just like a diet. If you're not ready to lose weight, if you're not ready to get healthy, it's not going to happen. Um, they'll be ready to set priorities based on their needs, not wants. And that comes from really closely looking at their bank statements, um, They'll want to weed out the things that they don't really need. But so many people don't even look at bank statements. They just look at the bottom line. They look at how much is left. They don't look where the money's going. So using a budget, they get to actually look at where the money's going because they're looking at their bank statements. They're writing things down. Here's another reason. It takes 21 days to change a habit. Okay, 21 days. If they can stick with it for a month, if they can do a budget for a whole month and see results, and I'll tell you, I was just speaking to a, a group of women last night, and I hadn't been there for a month, and the, the, as soon as I sat down, one of the women said, I did it. I saved money last month. I, I wanted to save 200 but I managed to save 150 And she was one of those women that never had money, but it took her a whole month of going through all of her spending to realize that she did have money left over. Um, they'll be able to keep the wolf from the door. That's a big one. If you're working with low to moderate income people, there's always the fear of not being able to pay something. If there's no more calls from creditors, if there's no more last-minute calls to the electric company before the service is shut off, they're going to see the merit in a budget. And also, they're going to learn that money's a tool. It's just a tool. That's all it is. It's not a punishment. It's 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 not something that you should be ashamed of. Everybody does it. Um, Warren Buffett does it, for heaven's sakes. And it, it shouldn't be scary. It's not the enemy. Um, that, that they'll find themselves planning to spend money, not spontaneously spending money. And that's the difference. Once you plan, and that's kind of what zero, zero balance budgeting is about, you plan where you're going to spend your money. You can still have fun, but you're in control. And that's the part of budgeting that I like we give our folks a little bit of control, a little bit of power. The zero, if any of you have ever taken the Dave Ramsey um, class, I think it's called Peace University or something like that. I, I took it years ago because I wanted to see what all of the hullabaloo was about with Dave Ramsey and his 
his spending plans. And, and he does the zero balance budget. And I happen to believe in the zero balance budget because that means every penny is accounted for. There's never an opportunity where you have money left over at the end of the month that you get to spend. You, you will anyway with a zero balance budget, but it's not like, oh great, I got 200 bucks left over. Where can it go? What can? What do you want to do? Where do you want to spend the money? That's not the deal with a budget. A budget is thoughtful. So Dave Ramsey came up with this idea, and maybe he's not the only one, but um, the zero balance budget. He has a lot of other theories I don't necessarily agree with, but this one I do. And it, it's basically putting a name to every single dollar of your income. It involves your clients becoming intimately involved with their spending. They have control. The, the money doesn't leave their hands without them knowing where it's going. It's a choice. Um, there's no miscellaneous category, and and a lot of us do that. They say, well, just in case I need money, I'll save out $200. That'll be my miscellaneous. There, There's no miscellaneous. This is thoughtful. You plan where your money's going to go. So they use their bank statements, and if you've ever looked at your bank statements, because we use debit cards now, you get a real good feel for where your money is going. So they look at their bank statements. They plan where their money is going. It's already going. So now they're going to see where it's going and plan for it. Um, and what that means is if they go to Starbucks every day on their way to work and that fits in their budget, go for it. Go to Starbucks every day if that fits in your budget. If you go to Starbucks every day, but now you realize that you're $10 short of paying what you need to pay every every week, okay, maybe you can't go to Starbucks. But that's a choice you make. Um, their budget is fluid. It it moves with their wants, their needs, their goals. It's always changing because our lives are not static. Today everything is good. Tomorrow we need tires on the car. So it, it, it's fluid. Um, you can't have a master plan. You can't have some kind of a budget that you stick inside the cupboard door and, and look at that and that is your 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 money Bible for the year. That's not the way it happens. Um, it's it's a month to month, ongoing, in touch with your money type deal. So they have to stay in touch with their budget. They have to make tweaks. They have to look at their bank statements. They have to know what's going on. And that's that's kind of cool. That's kind of cool because especially with with uh, some of the young women that I work with. You do see the power that they get. You you, you see. Um, nothing's going to happen without some kind of a goal. I, I can't I can't lose weight unless there's a reason to. I also can't work the budget unless I have a goal. If I have a goal, it's going to make it a whole lot easier. If I'm going to to set a budget intrinsically just because today I feel like I, I want to do a budget It's going to be a short-term event. There has to be something outside of me that makes me want to do a budget, a goal. There has to be a goal. I work with families a lot. I, I also work with, with individuals. I also work with couples. But it's that's a really good time when you start to do a budget. That's a really good time to sit down and have a kitchen table dialogue. Where do you want to take this? If we're going to budget our money, how do we want to do it? What things are important to us? What reason do we have to watch our money besides just paying the electric bill and having enough money for groceries? What's another reason? So um, give everybody in the family a chance to contribute and then narrow down the collective goals or individual goals to one or two that might be accomplished within the confines of their budget. That means short term. Because you want you want them to succeed. Success is the key. Give them a chance to succeed. So if they set a short term goal, and, and this is how I would do it. This is where I have done it. And this is really probably the most fun of the budget because people get involved. So you give everybody in the family who's going to participate in the budget a piece of paper, and you tell each of them write down three goals, three goals that could be accomplished in the next three months. What is it that you want? Do you want to go to the zoo? 
Do you want to buy that new outfit you've been looking for? Do you want to take the family to a, a movie night? What is it that you want to do that we could save for over the next three months? So everybody writes it down, and then you you compare notes. Does anybody have anything in common? Is there something that you guys see within the family, or is there something that you see individually that is going to work together? And that doesn't mean you only get to have one goal. If it's a family, then, then maybe the, go the goals are small, and you could do two or three goals within that three-month period. So then you take those goals and how much money you think you have to save for those goals, and you put it in the budget. So there's the line that says goals. Or there's the line that says, you know, go into the zoo and out to dinner. Or, or there's the, the goal that says we are going to be um, taking a family vacation. Whatever it is, it's in the budget. And every pay period that you're putting money aside, you put money aside for that. Um, but giving the whole family an, a chance to get involved is pretty big, too. I don't know um, how any of you have worked with, with the folks that you work with, but if I can give the kids in the family a chance to make a difference, um, it's kind of like Habitat for Humanity. Ha uh, kids, kids can't build the house for Habitat for Humanity, but what they can do is get good grades. If they get good grades, that counts as work hours toward the house. It's big. It gets them involved. They have some control, some input. Same thing with a budget. If you can say to the kids, this is, this is our goal. This is what we want to do. How can you help me save money? Um, do you want to be in charge of the electric? Do you want to turn off all the lights before we go to school in the morning? Or, or maybe it's a couple, and one of them um, has a habit that costs a little bit of money. Maybe every weekend they want to get pizza and, you know, hang out with their friends. Okay, so, so maybe that's something that they could cut back on, and some of that money could go toward the goal. It's families and individuals are very different with their money, and they will know what they can do, but it's fun to watch. It's fun to watch if you get to stick around with them. So let's get to it. Um, using a balanced budget means that they have to know every penny of money that's coming into their household. Some folks don't know how to calculate their total household income, so you may have to help them with this. So, and, and I'm sure you know how. You know, if they if they get paid weekly, they multiply that by 52, divide by 12, and that's their monthly income. If they're paid biweekly. Uh, they multiply their take-home pay by 26 and then divide that by 12. But they want a very clear, complete idea of the amount of money that they come, have coming in that's net, their net income, not their gross. After they've established how much money they have coming in from wherever it's coming in from, even if it's food stamps, even if it's SSEI, even if it's child support, Everything counts in the total household income. That's the way a budget works. If you hold something out, that's not your true income. So then after they do that, have them gather their bank statements from at least three to six months because there's things that come up during a three to six month period that may not come up every month. For instance, if you go to the dentist. You don't go to the dentist every month, but I'll bet you within the last six months, somebody went to the dentist and there was some kind of a cost to that. Maybe you don't take the car in to get an oil change every month, but I bet within six months you do. So, so you want to look at least three to six months. And because we are a plastic society, have them get their credit card statements as well because, sadly, there's a lot of people that use their credit cards as income. It's not something they can not use to get through the month. Once they've got all that laid out and are familiar with what they're looking at, they're going to start with their fixed expenses. Okay? And those are the things that occur every single month without fail, don't change much month to month, like rent. 
If your rent is 900, your rent is 900. You plan for that every single month. If you have a, a an installment loan like a car payment or a student loan, that's a fixed payment that you have every single month. Those are easy to pull up off of their bank statements. They probably don't even need their bank statements for those. But anything like that, any child support they they pay, any um, child care that they have to pay, anything like that. Credit cards can go either way. I, I kind of like to think of credit cards as being flexible because if, if I have a client with credit card debt, I like them to pay it down. That means I don't want them to pay the minimum payment. I want them to pay the minimum payment plus another amount that they can afford so they can pay it down. So although some people may use credit cards within the fixed expenses part. So they, they build their budget by listing all of their recurring fixed expenses and the average amount that they dedicate to those expenses every month. And I, I say average only because maybe there is a little bit of wiggle room. I would never put an electric bill in fixed unless they're on the budget plan. If they're on the budget plan, which actually can save them money, then that would be a fixed expense. So, But they will know what they're doing once they get started. They'll get really involved. They subtract those expenses now from their total net income. Now they've got some money left over. So write down the amount they have left over. And now they're going to make a list of their flexible expenses. The flexible expenses are a little bit different than the fixed ones. And it may take a minute to figure out even what they are. Um, and they may have to use their credit card as part of the input for this. But I don't want that to dissuade them, even if they are using their credit card to pay some of their flexible expenses. They have to know what it is. It has to go on their budget. So the, the, the flexible expenses vary from month to month. So that could be credit cards. It could be their electric bill. It could be definitely groceries. Um, it could be the gas that they put in their car. Um, long there, there's a lot of different things that that come into their budget that change from month to month, and they will be able to pull that up off the, off of their bank statement. Once they've got all of those, and that's why I want them to look for six months, because there's going to be things that show up that are not every month, but they are important enough to put into the budget. So. All of those flexible expenses, add them up and subtract them from the leftover net income after the fixed expenses. Well, now, this is what happens. Sometimes they're in the negative at this point because if they have been using their credit card, the credit card is income to them. So if they're in the negative and if part of this whole deal of budgeting is to be able to pay down their credit cards, then they got to go back and tweak. They've got to tweak those flexible expenses. We'll talk a little bit more about that later, but there are ways to cut back on the flexible expenses. But it has to be a buy-in from everybody in the family. This budgeting stuff is, is not for somebody to do all alone. The whole family has to buy into this because there might be tweaking that will impact one person more than another. So we've already done the, the fixed expenses. We've done the flexible expenses. Hopefully there's still a little bit of leftover money. But now let's interrupt this broadcast for an important message. Um, as, as they're going through their bank statements and their credit card statements, they're going to find often, every time, that some of their recurring flexible expenses are for wants rather than needs. Maybe we don't even realize that there's a difference between one kind of spending and another, but have them look at their flexible expenses. Have them stop right there and with a pen on their bank statements, circle the ones that are needed. I need this and a need is different for you than it is for me, but a budget is definitely going to tell you what you need and what you want. The things that Warren Buffett needs are different than the things I need because I can't afford the things that Warren Buffett can afford. So my wants and needs are different. Every one of your clients, their wants and needs will be different. It is all dependent upon their income and what must be paid. And 
you you I'm sure you do this too. You have to have a place to live. You have to have utilities. You have to have food to eat, and you have to have transportation. Those are four critical things that you've you've got to make sure you've got those. After that, let's see, you know, where the lay of the land is. But have them figure out which ones are their wants, which ones are their needs, two lists. And then while they're looking at the wants, the things that they purchased as wants, how would things be different if they did have it? And what would change if they didn't have it? If they notice that three times a month they go to McDonald's and it has become a flexible expense, it's part of their food for the month, how would things change if they did not go to McDonald's three times a month? If they go to the mall on payday after work and they try to find some new article of clothing to buy just because they gotten paid and they need a reward. How would their life change if they didn't do that? Would it change negatively? Would it change positively, financially? So, But it's a, it's a dialogue they can have with themselves. It's a dialogue they can have with you. Sometimes that's kind of fun. Can, can I tell you a story? Um, I, I've worked with so many women, and there was a, one woman who loved TJ Maxx, loved TJ Maxx terribly. And she would go to TJ Maxx and just walk around and, and browse. Inevitably, she would bring things home. And we had, uh, this was a couple of years ago, we had a long, long discussion about maybe not going to TJ Maxx if that's her her drug of choice as far as spending money. So we didn't meet for about a week, and we met again. And she goes, i got to tell you, I went to TJ Maxx. And because she was trying so hard not to, to buy anything, she was overwhelmed with buying things. Her little shopping cart was so filled with things that someone in the store thought she was an employee putting things away. But that didn't dissuade her. She um, she went and bought everything and took everything home and, and laid it out. And then the next day she took everything back. It It was just a reflex to buy whatever she could because she thought that the buying was going to be over. She wasn't going to buy anything again because of her budget. I don't know what ever happened to her. I haven't talked to her in a while, but that was like an eye-opener for her. Okay, I got it. Now, there's always going to be irregular expenses. But even though they don't come up that often, it's something that we should, if we're going to do a zero budget, a zero balance budget, we, we need to add these to our budget. Um, and they're, they're the things I was talking about before. You know, auto insurance, birthday gifts, taxes, medical bills, um, tires, um, summer programs for the kids, the things that come up maybe once a year, but they're big things. They're big things that you have to plan for. So these irregular expenses, once you figure out what they are and how much they are, divide by 12. So if you know that you're going to need tires and those tires are going to cost 600 bucks, divide by 12, find a place in your budget for those tires, and it's $50 a month that you're going to add, and you're going to leave it there. It's going to stay with your budget. It's going to stay in your bank account because at some point you're going to need tires. Um, subtract those irregular expenses from the rest of the leftover income, if there is a rest of your income, and then tweak them. Tweak, tweak until you get it so that it's zero. And what that often involves is you're able to put money in savings because if you do have, if you've accounted for the, the, the night you want to go to McDonald's and that's in your budget, you've accounted for a goal, you've accounted for um, getting tires on your car, you've accounted for all of those things and still there's 50 bucks left over and you know that you want your income minus your expenses to equal zero, awesome. You have 50 bucks. Throw it in your savings because savings is part of the budget as well. In fact, that's probably the first thing you should do is plan for your savings. Once you reach zero for this month, you're good. You're good to go. Your income minus your expenses for this month are equal to zero. And maybe you won't tweak much Maybe there will not be a lot of tweaking, but you're always going to keep this budget in the back of your mind. And you are going to paste it to the inside of your kitchen cupboard. You are going to look at it. You're not going to go, great, done. 
got a budget and, you know, put it in the desk drawer and let it go. It's something that you'll pay attention to. This little bit, this that I'm going to tell you, something to think about is probably the thing that has the most impact overall with everybody that I talk to, everybody. It's the debit card. The debit card creates a situation where we don't have to have self-control. And there's there's a slew of studies out there that compared cash and uh, card spending behaviors, and they all came to the same conclusion. You spend more money with plastic. And part of the reason behind this is the disassociation factor. You don't feel like you're really parting with money when you swipe your card at a terminal. And children now don't understand when you say you don't have enough money because you do. you got that plastic card. What are you talking about? There's plenty of money. There isn't. You know it and I know it. And if you ever looked at your bank statement and looked to see where the debit card spending is, you could be horrified. And In fact, there was a woman I was just working with, awesome woman, up in Brooklyn. And uh, she told me right away from the right from the get-go back in January, she said, you know, this is kind of futile because I don't even have any money. I don't have enough money. You've heard this. I don't have enough money to budget. Why do I need to budget? I, I you know, there's nothing there. But we, we motored on, and we did a budget. And sure enough, she showed me the budget. Nope, she didn't have any money to spare. So then I said, can you, can you do a favor? I want you to take your bank statements just for one month, and I want you to write down everything that came off of your debit card. Write it all down. And then I want you to separate it out and tell me what you think you had to spend and what you didn't have to spend. Well, let me tell you, this was a big deal. This was a very big deal with her. She got back to me and she said, I'm outraged. I'm absolutely outraged. I didn't know I was spending that kind of money. Um, in one month, February, she spent a little over $900. This is someone who has no money to budget. A little over $900. Uh, 600 she said she could count as, as needs. 300 were wants. And she told me that she had been wandering around in CVS. She was trying really hard not to use her debit card. And she was wandering around in CVS looking for something to buy. When it occurred to her that what she was doing was looking for something to buy. Because she was bored and she was in CVS and CVS has a lot of good stuff to buy. So but that and and she just emailed emailed me that today and that was pretty pretty awesome for me to hear. But I I work with people all the time, and one thing that I tell them is to stop using your debit card. And I've had different people tell me that I'm always chirping in the back of their head when they bring out their debit card because they know it's a leak to pull it out and use it. I know it's a leak, and I'm chirping in their head when I'm not even there. So have have them pull out their bank statements and look at all the stuff that they've swiped for, write them all down. There's going to be a lot. Some things they won't know. Some things they won't be able to identify because if they're taking cash back at the register, um, they won't even know. If if they bought groceries and then added an extra 40 to the grocery bill, they won't know that they spent an extra 40. Um, they, actually, they won't know until they do the laundry and find 40 bucks floating around in the washer. Um, because that's when we take money at the terminal when we get groceries, um, it is absolutely mindless. We don't even think of it. We just know that we took money and it, we're free to do whatever we want with it. Um, have them keep running total as they work through their statements. Was it a want? Was it a need? And then add it all up. Um, and they may be horrified. They may not be horrified. They may go, yeah, this is this is what I spend money on. And it's okay, but I would tell them, the, the money that they're using with their debit card, the things that they really need to spend the money on, give themselves a cash allowance for that. If you have ever bought groceries with cash on a, in a list, it's a whole different event than going to get groceries with a debit card and no list. Um, if you are hungry on your way home from work and you have $20 as your, your cash allowance for this week, 
or a debit card, you, you might be compelled to use the debit card because you don't want to break into the 20. It's a, it's a hard thing to get used to not spending money any way you want, any time you want. But if a budget is going to work, then you, you, you have to make it work. You have to be conscious of every penny that you're spending. And again, that doesn't mean that you have to be um, um, somehow punished for spending money. Spend the money. Just make sure the money you're spending is part of your budget that you can afford it. And then there's the other plastic. I want to say this once because this is mm. this really is painful. If someone is using their credit card as income and they have to use it, I do debt management, and, and I know people don't want to give up their, their credit cards. They want to get rid of the debt, but they don't want to give up the credit cards just in case. So this is what you say. If you're going to use your credit card and you can't afford it, then something has to happen. You have to earn more or spend less, bottom line. And I say that all the time to people. You have, if you can't make it happen, if your budget doesn't work, you want to get out of debt, you want to stop using your credit card, then earn more money. Or go back to that budget and find a way to spend less. Because increasing debt with a credit card is kind of counterproductive to a budget. Um, part of this whole budgeting thing is to reduce debt while saving money. You want the power that comes with saved money. You don't want to have more debt. There is no power in debt. There's power in savings. So I have a lot of tips. I have a lot of tips because a lot of people that I work with are low to moderate income people and they have tips. So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you about these tips, but I've got a few other tips too. Um, if you're getting groceries and, and making meals for yourself or for your family, I always believe in spending cash at the grocery store, not a debit card. I believe in clipping coupons for things that you need, not things that have coupons attached. You don't need a whole cupboard full of you know, antibiotic hand wash. You need food to eat. So clip coupons for needed items and make your menu from the ads. So when you're sitting there with the, the Sunday ads, create a, a menu based on what's on sale. And if you want to save money on your water consumption, don't let the water run. No? Don't don't run a dishwasher when it's half full or a, a washing machine half full. If there's any leaks, if your toilet's running, if your bathtub is, is leaking, fix it. That will stop the water consumption a little bit. Electric usage. I had a woman, one time she told me that she and her kids were going to start living in her van because they wouldn't turn off everything in the house. And the electric bill was running her 300 a month and she couldn't afford it. So she warned them that they were going to be living in the van and she told them what they had to do. So they started turning off the lights and unplugging computers. They had, there was five kids. They were running computers at night, leaving them on, and that cord gets so hot that that means money. Um, they were running TVs at night. Uh, they were leaving the pool filter on all the time. So they changed their attitudes, and the electric bill went down. They didn't have to live in the van. But there are things you can do. Change your filter on your air conditioner. Put your electric on the budget plan. Um, turn the lights off. Really, really, really do unplug computers. Unplug TVs. Um, fast food. Nothing wrong with fast food, but use cash. Mm. Don't take your debit card to the fast food store because then you'll, you'll, you'll buy more. If you use cash, that will save money because it's not bottomless. You can only buy a certain amount. Check the website for coupons. All of the fast food places have coupons. Um, buy from the dollar menu. Skip your drink. Don't get a drink. Bring water in the car. And gasoline, this is the one. It's kind of futile because gas just went up 13 cents a gallon here, so no matter what I do. But slow it down. Uh, turn off your air conditioner. Empty your trunk. That's a big one. Take Take things out of your trunk and top up your tire pressure. And if you're going to the movies, that's okay. If you want to go out, that's okay. But, you know, if you're on a budget, if you're trying to cut back, you go to the matinee, use the library, use the red box. Um, when you eat out, go to the early bird special. Um, use your, your AAA discounts. Or 
stay home. Find stuff to do at home. Every bit of this, though, is individual. Every bit of this has to do what your budget allows. And my budget may allow me to go out to dinner once a night, or I mean once a, once a night, once a, uh, a week or once a month. Your budget may not. Everybody's budget is different. But I've got a few more tips that, that I want to give you. And these are things that I see and I use, and they're they're always the first things that I talk about. Put the debit card away. If you really want to stick to a budget, put the debit card away. Um, debit cards make you overspend. If you're taking money out of the ATM, stop doing that because there's a fee. If you're not using your bank's ATM, if you're going into the, the gas station to pull money from the ATM, you're, you're spending extra money. And non-sufficient funds happen in a hurry when you're taking money out of the ATM. With your budget, plan how much cash you need and keep the cash with you. It's, it's your pocket money. Know where it's going. It's not random money to spend. Um, have your savings, any savings that you are able to budget, have it automatically taken out of your paycheck so you never see it. If you don't see it, you won't miss it. Um, and also, this is a big one. Make sure you're not the only guy in the family that is is doing the budget. Make sure everybody's on board. You cannot budget alone in a family. You can't budget alone in a couple. Everybody has to do the budget with you. Everybody has to be on board. So start a dialogue. Talk about what's going to work. If, if everybody isn't buying in, it's not the time to do a budget. You've got to make it work so everybody's happy. And then stick to the budget. Don't, don't do it for a month and go, phew, good, I'm done, I'm good, we did a budget. It's like a diet. You don't do a diet for one week. If you're going to be on a budget, you're going to be on a budget. That's such a horrible, harsh word. But if you're going to watch your money, if you're going to manage your money, if you're going to make sure everything is paid on time, if you're going to get rid of the creditors calling you, if you're going to build your credit, you have to watch your money. And and also, um, if your bank doesn't have an online budgeting tool, if if, bank, if you're not with Bank of America or Wells Fargo or whatever that, that has those online budgeting tools, I would recommend to everybody that they find an app that they can look at their accounts. The, the one I use is Mint, and I, I wish they paid me for saying it because I tell everybody to use Mint. Mint is a M-I-N-T dot com, a wonderful app that I can put my budget in that that app. I put my budget in and I can watch my money as I spend it, and I know how close to the edge I am, I can also look at all of my accounts every day. Um, part of that is because I, I worry about identity theft. Um, but, but there are a lot of individual things that you all know that work. There are things that your clients know that work. So it's a group effort to, to find the best way to watch the money to make sure that every penny is accounted for, that there's not that random money out there that's leaking away uh, that everybody scratches their head about. Um, I, hard to believe, but I think that's that's about all I've got to say about budgets. Keith? Good. All right. Oh, thank you very much, Marlene, for uh -huh. that wonderful presentation on um, budgets and the importance of reviewing those and sticking to those and um, why everyone should have one. Um, we do have a few minutes to go over questions um, that have come in, and we've got some great questions, and I'm hoping that um, you will be able to assist us with those, Marlene. Um, yeah, I do the first question is, how can we find someone in our area to help a low-income family go through this process and create a budget? Well, um, United Way, at least in our area here, I'm down in Florida, United Way always partners with different organizations um, that work with financial stability. So that might be a good place to start. Um, 211 also, if you have 211 in your area, um, 211 may hook you up with one of the nonprofits that does um, this type of thing, budgeting or, or just money management. 
I would always go with a nonprofit, though, not a for-profit. Okay. Thank you very much. Is there any process that people should go through, uh, maybe checking um, organizations out through the Better Business Bureau, anything along those lines that you would recommend? Um, you could. I, I trust United Way because they, they are a pretty tough organization to even be recommended by. Okay. Um, I think the main thing, though, Keith, would be uh, you don't need to pay a nonprofit organization or you don't need to pay a for-profit company to do this type of thing. There are tons of nonprofit organizations out there that will help. Lots. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, the next question is, we work with a large number of individuals who are high-functioning, developmental disabled. Are you aware of any programs or agencies that provide a budgeting class um, to disabled individuals on very fixed incomes of only Social Security? Um, the one that pops into my head, but it's not a national coming service source. Abilities, um, I don't know if you've heard of abilities or service source that's in our area. Um, but my guess is that that's another organization that United Way would be able to pull up and help with. Okay. Um, and the just, next a, sorry, Keith, sorry. just a reminder to everyone on the line, if you are looking for resources such as curriculum for individuals with disabilities, please feel, free, please feel free to reach out to us here at National Disability Institute. We'd be happy to support you in that endeavor. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, the next question that we have is, I have a client struggling with medical debt. Do you have any suggestions on how someone can work with their medical providers? It depends if it's gone to collections or not gone to collections. Um, if it's already gone to collections, um, well, the, the damage is done if it's already gone to collections, and, and even paying it generally is not going to change the damage that's done. If it is not gone to collections, the only hope is to to go to whatever facility it is that, that holds the paperwork for those debts and try to make a plan. Um, Medical debt is tough because medical debt is so big usually. Um, so y you just have to work with whoever provided the service and see if they will make it more affordable for you. Here in Florida, for a long time, we had charity care, uh, which would cover uh, expenses, uh, especially for nonprofit hospitals. I, I don't think we have very many nonprofit hospitals anymore that, that use charity care. But talking to the the budgeting office or the finance office or who, the billing office, talking to them before it gets out of control is the number one best thing you can do. And, and all of you know that the best thing you can always do is get on the phone right away and let them know that you're having a problem because bottom line, they want to get paid. So if they want to get paid, they're going to try to figure it out. All right, thank you very much. We're receiving a lot of um, questions around motivation and how do you motivate someone to want to take control of their finances. Do you have any tips or suggestions around that? They have to have a goal. They have to have a goal. That's it. There has to be a reason. Um, it, it, if they don't have a goal, if, if we're asking them just to intrinsically um, um, start budgeting their money, they're not going to stick with it. There has to be a reason. Maybe they want to retire someday, and they never thought it was going to be possible, and then you show them how they, they could retire if every month they start tucking away 100 It has to be a goal that they will buy into. That's the only way. Thank you very much. Um, you mentioned in your presentation um, either earn more or spend less. What are some of your ideas that have helped your clients in the past earn more money? I'm a big fan of uh, part-time work and uh, temporary work. And I don't know if everyone else is like me, but I go to Indeed.com, and uh, I have found dog walking jobs for people. You know, $10 an hour to walk a dog. Um, 
Kelly Services down here is real big, and Kelly Services will put people into temporary part-time jobs. It's not as easy for people to earn money, and, and I've been working just recently with folks that, that do need to earn just a little bit more money. Um, some of them I have said if you have an extra room in your house, maybe you could rent that room out, and, and some people actually have done that to get a little bit more money in. Um, it's individual to whoever you're working with and what their situation is. Some people will not want to work a second job or will not be able to work a second job. So you have to get creative. You have to think outside the box. That's the fun part of our job is looking at these individuals and going, okay, what is it in their life that we can do to get them to earn a little bit of extra money? Um, it's actually easier to spend less than it is to earn more. But if you go to if you go to indeed.com, <laughs> indeed.com and look at part-time jobs, you're going to get a lot of ideas. Okay. There's lots of good ideas. Wonderful. Um, uh, another question came in. You mentioned ment.com, but are there any other resources, apps, websites um, available that that you're familiar with that you um, use on a regular basis? Uh, Mint, M-I-N-T, is the one that I use all the time. Um, a lot of the banks have their own. Um, and I'm not I'm not really familiar with a lot of the other ones, um, but but there are others out there, and you could do a search. Just make sure anything that you're going to use, um, go on YouTube and and find out if it's a valid uh, app to use. If it's a good don't don't get into anything that's not secure. Okay. And and, uh, we, uh, sorry, Keith. <laughs> Elizabeth. Also, you know, we we here at NDI we love amongst our staff to check out all of the different apps that come out: Hello Wallet, Power Wallet, Mint, um, Cash Trails, uh, Pay Perks. There's a lot of different apps that we test out as members of the staff here. So, if you come upon something and you're kind of wondering about it, or um, we also have someone here who will kind of test the accessibility of different apps for us. So if we can be of support to you in that way, please do reach out to us and let us know. Elizabeth, do you guys have a favorite? It depends on which staff member you're talking to. Oh. <laughs> and some of that depends on the age and the, um, the techie, yeah. tech savviness of the staff member. Yeah. Um, so it really depends. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, we did receive another question in the chat box. How do you help someone budget if their income is only from part-time work? Yeah, that, that actually just happened to me. It's it's really hard to budget money if your income is only from part-time work because that may not be enough to, to make ends meet. Um, so the first thing you have to do is write down everything that you have to pay, have to. So those four things again, a place to live, utilities, food, and transportation. Those are the four things that you have to pay for. If your part-time income covers those things, then you're going to have to cut back everything else. And it, and it does become punitive at that point if you're only able to work part-time. So that's when you start looking, well, if I have two bedrooms, can somebody live with me and share the the load of, of the expenses of living here. Um, what Can I put my electric on the budget plan? Um, are there other resources out there for low-income people? Um, it, it, Part-time part -time work is often not an easy way to run a budget because you're, you're going to run into the red every month unless you, unless you really cut back and just look at the very basics. And we did have someone pop into the chat box to, to, just to send a reminder to everyone that folks could also take a look at referring to other programs and agencies that that individual may be eligible for, um, which is a great suggestion for many of the questions that have come up today, relying on those other partners who are doing some of the services or supports that would complement the needs of the people that you're serving. Thank you very much. Um, well, we are coming up on the um, one hour time set for this webinar, and there were a few questions that we weren't able to get to. So um, I would um, 
recommend that I will take a look at those questions and I will get those to Marlene. And if there are any other questions that come up after the fact, um, again, my email address is kcombs, C-O-M-B-S, at ndi-inc.org, and I'd be more than happy to work with any questions um, after this webinar. Um, but again, we, we do want to thank um, our speaker today, Marlene Ware, um, and Elizabeth Jennings for our technical support. Um, and we are in the process of setting up for our next webinar, which is going to be um, April 9th, uh, 2014, from 3 to 4. And the topic that day is going to be measuring the financial cap capability of persons with disabilities. Um, this webinar, as well as past webinars, can um, or can be accessed through our website, www.realeconomicimpact.org. Um, all of our trainings and webinars are archived on the website for um, for you to view after the, after we deliver them here. Um, but again, we do want to thank everyone um, for attending the webinar today, and a special thank you to our sponsors. Um, We'd like to recognize again Walmart, Bank of America, Accorda Therapeutics, the Burton Blatt Institute, and the IRS. Um, some ways to remain in, um, connected with National Disability Institute, again, our website is um, www.realeconomicimpacts.org. Um, we're also on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Flickr, and Tumblr. And again, thank you very much for your time today, and we look forward to next month's webinar. Thank you, Marlene. Thank you, you guys. It was fun. Thank you, Marlene. Bye.